Wow. Just such a tremendous, sweet move of His Spirit in the house tonight. I don't want to disrupt anything. I want to just stay right in the center of God's will for us for tonight. If you need to tie that offering envelope, raise your hand. I will give you that chance to give, but would you please stay in an attitude of praise? Stay in an attitude of praise tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We praise you with our songs, though we praise you also with our lives as we worship you. We bow before you. We bow our will. We bow our hearts. We bow our attitudes. We bow everything before you, including our finances. We humble our finances before you, and we bring you the tithe. We bring you the offerings because we want you to know that we love you with all of our heart. And you said that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So our offering is just an extension of our heart to you tonight, Lord. Bless those that give. Bless those that give. Send it back to them multiple times over that, as you said in 2 Corinthians 9-11, that they may be, may be made rich in every way so they can be generous on every occasion. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and serve the people with the offering. Hallelujah. I am a, I'm, a, I'm excited about a new teaching series. I know we got a lot of folks out tonight. They're out celebrating the devil, and so they've lost their salvation now, and we'll have to pray them back into the kingdom. But uh, no, I did. We did have a lot of people tell us they had things their kids were going to be doing tonight. But uh, I get that, but uh, I just felt led to, to press ahead with this sermon series. I am going to have it. It's going to be on video. Typically, we have just been uh, filming our Sunday services and putting them on the web, but we're going to have this entire series on video as well. So uh, two reasons. One, those that miss can catch up and get this information also so that you can go back and listen again if you would like to. And the title of the sermon series is going to be called, is gonna, going to be called Better, Not Worse. Better, Not Worse. I like that little line in the wedding vows. It says that you take someone for better or for worse, right? And that's a wonderful statement because it says that on the best days of our marriage, I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to be committed. It also says on the worst days of our marriage, I'm going to be there. But I, I would like to rebuke this lie from Satan that says your best days of your marriage are behind you. I want to rebuke that. I want to bring correction and let you know that your best days can be ahead of you. The good stuff doesn't end after the honeymoon or after the first two years. It's not over with. It's not, you're going to get better, not worse in your marriage. Now, let me just throw this out here for those of you that are single, uh, not married. Uh, I want you to know there's going to be plenty of information that you can glean from. Much of what I'm going to teach, especially tonight, much of it's going to apply to so many other areas of your life other than just marriage. This is what I have found. Anytime you teach on marriage, you're teaching about Christ. And that's because he said that in Ephesians. He said message, he said marriage is a picture of Christ. Christ is a picture of marriage. So you can't teach on marriage without also teaching on something that everybody can uh, receive from. So you're going to get a lot of information that will help you on your job, uh, to advance your career. It'll help you in your financial management. It'll help you in your relationship with your best friends or extended family or whoever. So it's going to benefit you. So don't bail out because, oh, all he's teaching on is marriage. I promise there will be plenty in this series for everybody. But my heart has really been breaking for married couples. I hear so many stories of so many people, not just outside the church world, inside the church world, that are struggling in their marriages. They're struggling to, to, to just to, to plunge through. And I think they have bought the lie from Satan that, you know, this is just the way it is. You're not newlyweds anymore. It can't get any better. There's a million excuses out there. I'll cover some of those later as to why maybe we can't be happy. But I want to tell you, the devil is a liar. You can't have happiness in your marriage. You can't have satisfaction. Amen. Your marriage can be better, not worse. So uh, I just want to, I want to dive into this topic and teach about it. Uh, I will say this, now there are many statistics out there now that show those 
who regularly attend church, who are part of the Christian faith, they have a much higher success rate in their marriage than non-Christians. So do stay committed to church, but even within the body of Christ, there are many Christians out there who love the Lord, but they don't necessarily love their spouse so much right now. So we're going we're gonna to help you make your marriage better. Everybody say, it's going to be better. Elbow your neighbor if you've got one near you, or point to somebody, or look behind you and say, my marriage is going to be great. My going to be great. <laughs> All right. Hallelujah. Today, I want us to go back to the very beginning, or today, tonight, I want us to go back to the very beginning of marriage. I'm talking the very beginning, all the way back to the book of Genesis, to the first marriage. Go to Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to glean some things from a few verses here in Genesis 3 and Genesis 2. Going back to the very first marriage, what was, what was this couple's name? Adam and, Eve. Adam and Eve. All right, you know their names. We're going to look back at the very first couple, the couple God married. Can you imagine? God actually performed your ceremony. That'd be pretty cool, right? Not Pastor David or, or the preacher you grew up with. No, God came down from heaven and he presided over the ceremony and said, till death do you part. That'd be pretty awesome. Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to point out some things you might not be thinking about when you think of marriage teaching. And what I want to cover tonight are the first three mistakes that were ever made in a marriage. The first three mistakes, the first marriage mistakes. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Pay close attention to the next line of that verse after the comma. And you must not touch it or you will die. First First mistake I want to point out that this new couple made, and again, it's not just about their marriage, it's about their life in general. She made an assumption. Everybody, everybody say assumption. I've got three mistakes I want to talk to you about tonight. Each one of them will begin with the letter A. First one is assumption. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and you're going to realize that last statement was false that Eve made. She assumed something God did not say. She read into something that wasn't even there because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, before Eve was ever created, God said to Adam, this is what he said, he said, you are to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Notice, God doesn't say, don't touch it. Something happened. God said, don't eat from that tree. Don't eat that fruit. And somehow, Eve ends up reading into this situation things that God didn't say. And she tells the serpent, you're not even supposed to touch it. If you touch it, you will die. Which, you know, might not be such a bad idea to say, don't even touch it since you're not supposed to eat it. But the point is, God didn't say that. All God said was, don't eat the fruit. But that's not all the assuming that Eve will end up doing. Satan's going to come to her and he's going to say, now listen, you know, if you, you were to eat that, you'd be as smart as God. You'd have all the wisdom, all the knowledge that he has. God just doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. He's holding something back. And then it said there that, that she certainly believed it, that she, she believed it. She said, wow, okay, this is now my opinion. I believe God is holding something back back from me. He's, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And then it says, the woman was convinced. Let me tell you something. Just because you're convinced doesn't mean you're right. Just because you're convinced about something about your marriage, it doesn't mean you're right. Just because you're convinced about something on your job, it doesn't mean that you are right. She was convinced of a lie. She read into this situation and said, apparently, God is holding back on me. He just doesn't want me to have something good. When in reality, God was holding back the bad from her. He was protecting her. He was taking care of her. But the way she viewed it was, hey, I I'm looking at this situation. I'm reading into this situation. I'm assuming things. Apparently, God is not for me. He's trying to hold me back. But that could not have been further from the truth. I mean, these kind of assumptions can pop into your marriage so easily. Everything's fine in your marriage until you read that silly article in that silly magazine. 
Suddenly, we just don't have any passion. There's no spontaneity in our marriage. Our marriage is going down the tubes. And, you know, why you're reading Cosmopolitan, I don't know. That's the worst place in the world to get marriage advice. Everything was fine in your marriage until you saw some television show, some TV shrink. And suddenly now that some, some so-called uh, expert said this, now you assume there's problems in your marriage. And you're looking down on your spouse and thinking, oh, if only you could be like that person on Dr. Phil's show. If only you could be like Dr. Phil. That guy knows things, but no, not you. I'm stuck with you. Hello? You know, we, 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 we read some book or we start talking to our friends at work or, and, you know, some family member. And, and you're thinking, my marriage is pretty good. But then you look at this person. And you think, you assume they've got the greatest marriage in the world. You assume they don't have any problems. And then you think, my marriage is so bad. And you start feeling sorry for yourself and thinking, gee, if only I had a marriage like she's got with her husband or he's got with his wife. Oh, no, I'm stuck with old so-and-so over here, the old ball and chain. You know, I, my life is so bad. Poor, pitiful me. Woe is me. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. And you buy into a lie because you start assuming things that are not true. Stop just assuming things. Let me, uh, you know, my wife. She is a wonderful cook. Let me just start out by saying my wife is a fantastic cook, one of the best I've ever met. But in the last couple of years, she's decided we need to eat some healthier options. In particular, lower carb options. And my wife, like Eve, has become convinced that some foods taste just like other foods, only without the carbs. It's a lie from the pit of hell, I'm telling you. It might look like bread. It does not taste like bread. No, uh -uh. oh no, really, sir. This this tastes just like it's got the, the carbs in it. No, and no, it does not. Now there are a few things she's made that taste pretty good. And if you could put bread and baked potatoes with it, it might be all right. But uh, who, you know, she she's convinced that that food can be just as good and satisfying. And I'm not convinced of that yet. And there are a lot of things in your life that you can become convinced of. You can begin to assume that you know certain things. I mean, you can assume your boss is thinking something about you that they're not thinking. You can assume that your best friend is judging you when they're not because you saw some look in their eye or you, you looked over and you think you saw them whisper to their friend. And so you assume now they're talking about you behind your back or you walked by somebody at the mall and they were laughing. And so now you assume they're laughing at you. Do you see the things we, we do, the trouble we get ourselves in when we start assuming things? You assume that since you didn't get that job that for some reason they don't like you because of this or because of that when maybe... They just thought the other person was more qualified than you or maybe the other person was nicer to them than you were. I don't know. Just don't assume things. Everybody say don't assume. Okay. I want to kind of lay out, lay out kind of a scenario for you, an illustration here. Imagine this, okay? Uh, wives, your husband comes in and you go up to him and you say, how do you like my outfit? First of all, that's a setup right there. That is a setup. It's just wrong. Amen. All the men said... Amen. How do you like this outfit? And, and the guy responds, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Now, he just said, it's fine. Then you go, so you don't like it? What, you, just, you hate it, don't you? you? I can tell you just hate it. He says, no, seriously, I, it's fine. Oh, I know what fine means. Fine with you just means this right here, and you don't like it, and it's just horrible, and oh, he goes, I can't believe you don't like it. You just think it like, makes me look fat, don't you? You think I look like a big fat cow in this outfit? No, I, now, now, now is where we men make the even worse mistake of trying to fix things. We're going to explain what we mean. No, no, honey. No, really, it, it is fine. I mean, it's not as good as the outfit you wore on Valentine's with those stilettos, but, you know, still, it, it's, 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 it's not bad. Not bad. Now you read something else into it. Oh, so it's not good, and it's not bad. In other words, you really, it's like I said, you don't like it, and then the fight ensues and goes on for who knows how long. Can I just give you the definition of the word fine? The word fine is an adjective. It means of superior or best quality of high or highest grade. When something is fine, if he just said it's fine, he meant it was fine. But see, when you start assuming, well, apparently he's just trying to cover up the fact that he really doesn't like it and he thinks it's ugly and that's because he thinks I'm fat and he doesn't like my hair color and he doesn't like this. And the devil just starts feeding you lies to believe. 
I mean, really. And, and it's not just women. We men can, can buy into the same kind of assumptions and lies. You know, it, it might not be about clothes or are you looking fat. It may be about something to do with your job, your career, or your friends, whatever. We buy into these lies, and we start assuming things are negative when they're not negative. And next thing you know, relationships begin to deteriorate. Hello. So don't buy in to the lie. Here's, here's another example, and I'm going to pick on the ladies a little bit again because I'm a guy, and it's easier for me to pick on you than for, for the, me to pick on the men. But let's say your husband comes home. He comes home. It's on a Monday. It's, it's been one of those Mondays, really, really rough Monday. He's had the most horrible customers to deal with. His boss has been on him. His employees have been horrible. He's been on the phone talking to people all day long, and he just can't wait to get home and just say nothing, do nothing, but just go to his leather recliner and sit back and watch Monday Night Football. That's just what he wants to do. He wants to watch some sports, turn on ESPN, and he's sitting there staring at the 70-inch screen, and you're sitting over there, and these thoughts start popping into your mind. He's been home for all this time and hasn't seen me all day long, and he's not even talking to me. Where is our marriage going? We just don't talk anymore. We don't communicate. And next thing you know, you're telling him, why don't you love me anymore? Why don't we talk anymore? He just wanted to watch a ball game. You're staring at that silly screen, and we haven't even talked to each other. And he's just like, I'm just tired. And the next thing you know, the devil starts planting thoughts in both parties. Men, too. He's like, all she ever does is nag. I tell you, I, all I want to do is come home, watch me a little football, and just relax. And that woman just starts nagging and nagging. That's all she ever does, isn't it? And you start doing it. Come on, guys. I, I, I can't pick on the ladies without bringing us in on it, too. We assume things. We assume that she, she hasn't had a bad day. We assume she ought to be just fine. We're the only people that could have had a rough day. Stop assuming. Don't read between the lines. Can I tell you something? Most of the time, the only thing between the lines is plain blank paper. That's usually all that's between the lines. It's just blank paper. But we start reading into things and placing things there that are not there. And let me tell you, if you're in a habit of reading into words, if you're in a habit of, of planting these thoughts and these words out there that weren't actually said, you do a serious injustice to your spouse because what you do is you start tempting them to be deceptive. Okay, let me, what, do you, what do you mean, Pastor? You're tempting your spouse to be deceptive because if, they, if you're the type of person that always reads into things all the time, you're always getting upset over things, there is going to be this temptation. I'm not excusing lying. Lying is still a sin. Please don't do it. It's wrong. But there can be a temptation to say, uh, if I tell the truth, there's going to be this big thing. But if I can just tell them what they want to hear, we can just move on. And there's that temptation. Again, lying is wrong, period. Everybody say lying is wrong. Please don't think I am in any way making out lying to not be a big deal or, or encouraging you to do it. I'm not. It is absolutely wrong every single time. But I'm telling you, when you constantly read into things and, and stir up things, you create an environment where the person can be tempted to do the wrong thing because they, they, what you're doing, you're backing them into a corner and, and making them choose between keeping you happy or committing a sin. You know, it's one of the two. They can either upset you or they can commit a sin and lie and try to keep everything calm and happy. Don't, don't be a stumbling block in that way. Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister, and that could have said a husband or a wife. Don't, don't act in a way that would encourage your spouse to want to be dishonest or to hold back or to be quiet. I'm just going to be honest. Don't go to your husband and, and, and ask them, does this dress make me fat? Because if it does, you really don't want to hear the answer anyway, do you? I heard one, one uh, woman say, she said, ladies, get on a scale. If the needle goes up, your butt's getting bigger. Just deal with it. Don't bother asking your husband that question. That's totally up to you. But uh, don't, you know, if you're going to ask that question, by all means, don't get upset when you hear an answer you don't want to hear. Hello. And, and listen, this is not just a marriage thing. Don't bring up something at work if you don't want to hear the truth. You, know, you shouldn't make your coworkers walk on pins and needles around you either. Let's, uh, let's speak in a way that we're not becoming a stumbling block to other people and tempting them to want to do the wrong thing. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 13 says, Fools base their thoughts on foolish assumptions. So their conclusions 
will be wicked badness. Did you catch the end of that verse? When you start assuming things, when you have a bunch of foolish assumptions, the end result is wicked badness. Madness. In your brain, it's going to be madness. In your marriage, there's going to be madness. On the job, there's going to be madness. You're going to assume everybody's out to get you and everybody's discriminating against you and everybody's talking about you and your spouse is always offended at you or always hurting your feelings. You've got to say, you know what? I'm not going to assume anymore. I'm just going to let the facts speak for themselves. Everybody say, just the facts. Just the facts, folks. Just the facts. Assumptions create madness in your mind and marriage, you don't want to go that route. Along with assumptions, there's another major mistake made by the first couple in history. And uh, along with assumptions, there is a little problem that uh, we see Adam deal with called apathy. Apathy. We see her dealing with assumptions. We see him dealing with apathy. Genesis 2 verse 15, it says, God placed the man or placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him. You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. A couple of things I want you to notice. God gives Adam the command, don't eat from that tree. Therefore, it's now his responsibility. Also, God said, you're there to tend the garden. You're there to watch out for things. He even tells him, you're to subdue all of the creatures on the earth, including the creatures that creep on the ground. So it was up to him to keep an eye on that serpent that he just let his wife talk to. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought the, the, the reason that mankind sinned wasn't that Eve couldn't stand a, to not eat a piece of fruit. It's because her husband was apathetic and not doing his job as a leader in the garden. If the husband had done his job and been the spiritual leader of the home, that would not have happened. But he's sitting back being, unfortunately, guys, like so many of us men tend to do, and just hoping everything will just take care of itself. Maybe if I just don't say anything, it'll go away. You know, sit around and do nothing. That, I think that's a real issue, and certainly women can deal with it as well, but I think we men maybe deal with it more so than women. It's this idea of just let it go, just don't get involved, and hopefully it, it'll just work itself out. And we'll even make excuses for why it'll work itself out. I mean, after all, she's going to get mad no matter what. So why should I get involved? Why should I do anything? No reason for me to work on my marriage because no matter what I do, she always gets mad. She always nags. You know, it's just not going to work out. Whatever I say, he's going to think I'm dumb and ignore me anyway, so why even try to talk about it? I'm just going to get criticized. I'm just going to get put down. I'm just going to end up getting my feelings hurt, so I'm going to do nothing. Or you make up some other excuse like, well, all marriages are like this anyway. Or that's just the way men are. Or that's just the way women are. Or, you know, we're just not compatible together. Or they're never going to change anyway because that's the way their parents were and that's the way they are. That's the way their grandparents were. And so they go, it's hereditary. I know what, why should I bother trying to work on this marriage? It's not going to help anyway. Again, don't buy that lie from Satan. Your marriage can get better. Everybody say, it will get better. It will get better. Now, speaking of, speaking of apathy, God said this in Revelation chapter 3. He said, if you're lukewarm, in other words, if you're apathetic, he said, if you're lukewarm, if you're apathetic, I will spit you out of my mouth. God doesn't respond well to apathy, and your spouse will not either. Your, mar your spiritual life will not turn out well if you're apathetic. Your marital life will not turn out well if you're apathetic. You have to work on your marriage. You have to spend time. You have to invest in it. If we would spend more time fighting for our marriage, we would have less time spent fighting in our marriage. Amen. Can I repeat that one for you? and Put it up on the screen for me, please. If we would spend more time fighting for our marriages, we would spend less time fighting in our marriages. You need to fight for your marriage. Don't be apathetic. Work at it. Do what's necessary. I saw this beautiful thing. It was either, Christy, I can't remember, yesterday or the, or the day before one. We were at some store, and this man, probably 70 years old, I noticed that he's standing on the passenger side of his car by himself, just holding the door handle. And I think maybe we were looking for a parking spot. So I'm thinking maybe this guy's about to, to give up his parking spot. So I'm waiting, and I'm thinking, 
dude, how long are you going to stand there? I can tell he's apparently ready to leave, but he's just standing right by the passenger door, not the driver door. He's standing there, and we're waiting for like 60 seconds, then two minutes, two and a half, three minutes. Finally, finally, uh, uh, another lady about his age walks out, walks across the parking lot. I guess she was talking to somebody or in the restroom. He then opens the door for her. She gets in the car. Then he shuts the door. At that point, he walks around the car, and he gets in the car himself. And I thought, wow, that's a man at 70 years old who has not tr stopped trying to win the heart of his wife. He's still fighting for his marriage. He's still working to be the gentleman that he needs to be to show his wife how much he loves them. Listen, don't stop buying flowers. Don't stop sending texts and saying, just want you to know that I'm thinking about you and I love you. Don't stop holding the door for them, men. Don't stop, don't stop giving them kisses on the cheek. There's a, uh, a study that came out that, uh, that my wife read. She told me about uh, that, uh, what, you're... It's, your marriage will be significantly happier if you will make sure before you ever leave each other that you always kiss each other on the lips. Just give each other a kiss before you go to the grocery store, before you go to work. It's, I forget all the details of the study. It was on the news. But you're, you're going to be happier and healthier. You're actually healthier if you will give your wife a kiss or give your husband a kiss before you leave each other's presence. Work on your marriage. Fight for your marriage. Galatians 6, 9 says this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Can I tell you something? The thing that's destroying marriages is not irreconcilable differences. It's people not working. They quit working on the marriage. And when you quit working on the marriage, the marriage will start to disintegrate. You stop maintaining your house, your house will fall apart. I, I was on Facebook, and uh, somebody's got for sale a 1970 white Corvette with T-tops. It's a limited edition. Only 10,000 of them were made that year because of a union strike. And that thing is in mint condition. Everything on it's been restored, and I'm looking at it, and it's just this incredible price. I don't need it. so. But still, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, but you know what? If I had it, I don't have a garage, so I have nowhere to store that. So if I just left that sitting underneath the trees in my driveway, that thing's going to begin to fall apart. I don't know how to work on the car. I, it's got all these old parts that I won't know anything about. I don't have anywhere to store it. And if I don't take care of that car, even though it might be a good deal, that car that doesn't have a spot of rust on it will probably have rust on it pretty soon because you have to take care of it. You have to protect it. Listen, your marriage has got to be protected. You've got to work on the relationship. You've got to protect the relationship. You've got you to make sure that you are doing what is necessary. You can't allow yourself to become apathetic. It says you reap a harvest if you don't give up. So don't quit trying to make your relationship better. Don't assume don't read, don't read between the lines, don't read into words and assume things that aren't actually being said. Can I, can I just throw this out there? Speaking of assuming again, there are a lot of people that think they have the gift of discernment and all you really are doing is judging. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's a lot of people that call it discernment and all you're really doing is judging people. You see some look or you think some thought and you just assume that's the Holy Spirit. Don't just assume things, okay? Okay. Now listen, I believe in the gift of discernment, and when the Holy Spirit does tell you something, that's great. But let's, let's be willing to, to walk in grace and mercy and be willing to give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. Hello. Amen. Now I get it. If your spouse is a habitual liar, that's, that's a different story. you got a foundation issue there. You can keep patching the sheetrock, but the sheetrock is going to keep cracking if you don't fix that foundational issue of, of uh, dishonesty. But unless you're dealing with something like that, be willing to just say, okay, I want to hear what you're saying, not what I think you mean by what you're saying. Amen? Don't assume. Don't have apathy. Number three, stop accusing. Stop accusing and assessing blame to other people. First thing that happens when this new couple gets into trouble, you know, they've, they've, they've both eaten the fruit. Eve eats it because uh, Adam is apathetic. He's not watching. He's not taking care of his wife. And then he's so apathetic in his relationship with God that when she comes back and offers him a bite, he doesn't even argue with her about it. He's like, okay, looks good to me. Let's try this. Well, you know, they get called. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12 after getting called, God comes up to him and says, what have you done? And this is Adam's response. The man replied, I love this. Every time I read it, it makes me giggle. 
Because this is just so much like so many people that I know, including myself. It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit. And I ate it. It was the first thing he does is start accusing her and casting blame on her. It's her fault. Listen to me. That's one great way to destroy your marriage. When you every time there's a problem, it's their fault. It's their fault. It's their, it's not my fault. No, no, no. It's their fault. And you want to put all the blame on them. They don't treat me right. They don't love me like they should. They don't talk to me enough. Listen, stop casting blame on everybody else and look inward and say, okay, God, show me what I can change in my life. Show me how I can improve myself. Show me what seeds I need to be planting. Maybe the reason you're reaping such a bad harvest in your marriage is because you're planting the wrong seeds. Amen. Mm. The first time something went wrong, he blames her and then she blamed the devil. I love that. The devil made me do it. The serpent, he's the one who handed me the fruit. He told me this little story. And, you know, we got to quit blaming, got to quit blaming your mother in law. She's blaming somebody else. She, was, she, she couldn't blame Adam, so she's blaming the serpent. And, you know, we'll blame it, blame it on the job. Well, I just can't have a happy marriage because I have to work so much. That's hogwash, okay? If, if, if it's truly coming down to the job or your marriage, you choose your marriage every time. Hello? Go to work at McDonald's and make minimum wage if you have to, but you take care of your marriage. Hello? Stop making excuses. Well, you know, it's just the way we were raised, or it's just our personality, or it's just that. No, 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 no. You can work on your marriage. Hello? You can work on your marriage. You, the Bible says all things are possible with God. You just got to be willing to work on it and stop blaming everybody else. Everybody say, stop blaming everyone else. Stop blaming everyone else. A few months ago, I preached a sermon, and I made this statement. I said, if you keep getting fired over and over and over again, stop blaming your bosses because you're the common denominator. Amen. Ten jobs, ten different bosses, you're the one that got fired every time. It's probably something you need to work on in you. And again, when it comes to problems in the marriage, I know this is the case with me. I'll, I will go to pray. I'll, we'll, be, we'll be in the middle of a, of a heated, heated discussion. And, uh, and I'll be frustrated and a little angry, and I'll go in there to pray. the Lord, I don't, you're just going to you're gonna have to do something about her. And I'll, I'll start complaining to the Lord about my wife and telling him how she made this woman. It's your fault, God. You gave me that woman. And, you know, the woman you gave me, is just, it will not be five minutes into that prayer of my complaining. And suddenly the Holy Spirit will begin to show me all the things in my life that I need to change. And you know what? It's funny. Once I change me, Things suddenly aren't so bad with her. Amen. It just happens that way. Once I start changing me and I start planting the right seeds into her, then I start reaping the right harvest from her. Hello, you got to make up your mind. I'm going to quit blaming other people and I'm going to work on me. Elbow your neighbor and say, I'm going to work on me. In this sermon series, I want you to stop blaming other people and I want you to take on the responsibility of going to God and saying, God, show me how to fix my life. Show me what I need to do differently to have a great marriage. Show me what, what I can change. Not, not how do I get my husband to change. I can't tell you how many times people come up to me, will you pray for my wife or pray for my husband because they're just, they're horrible. You just need to pray for them. Start dealing with yourself and then just turn that over to God and say, God, you're a big enough God to take care of them. I, can I tell you, God doesn't need to hear your complaints about your spouse. Amen. He already knows what's going on with your spouse. You just need to go to him and say, God, change me, and then just tell him, say, I give them over to you. I believe you're a great enough God to take care of whatever's going on in my marriage. We may have obstacles. We may have problems. But, God, you're big enough to overcome those obstacles. Hallelujah. Right. I want you to stop casting blame and accusing others for all your problems. I want you to stop being apathetic and realize I, it's going to take some work. Great marriages don't accidentally happen. Christy and I have been married uh, for over 32 years now, and I posted that on Facebook, and I had at least 15 people wish us a happy anniversary. Uh, it's not till July. But uh, I was just, I, one, I was just bragging about my wife and how wonderful I think she is. And number two, I was advertising the sermon series coming up. And a lot of people thought it was our anniversary. And I, I thought that was sweet that they wanted to say something nice. But uh, we have been married for over 32 years. It'll be 33 in July. And, uh, and I, I tell people all the time, I think we have the greatest marriage I've ever been around. I mean, we just have a phenomenal marriage. But it's required a lot of work. And it still requires, listen, 
I just feel like the Lord wants me to say this. You can't make it to, to the 20-year mark or the 30-year mark and then shift into neutral and just start coasting in your marriage and just assume, well, we've been married long enough now. It doesn't require any more work. It constantly requires work. Christy and I still have disagreements now. And I point out to her that she's wrong and she repents and things get better. And that, <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm, I'm surprised apples and oranges aren't being thrown from the sound booth where she's at. And see, it happens every time. The lights go off on me. Why? The, and our sound, our sound and lighting engineer up there is a guy. He should be on my side, not her side. I don't know what. She has a superpower. She controls people. Anyway, no, you can't be apathetic. You have to keep working. No matter how, whether you've been married six months or 60 years, you have to keep working. I hear reports all the time of couples that have been married 30 and 40 years suddenly filing for divorce. I think at some point they shifted into neutral and became apathetic and said, oh, we're okay. And, and you'll say things like, well, she knows I love her. No, not if you're not expressing it. And uh, you say, well, but I tell her all the time. But are you displaying 1 Corinthians chapter 13 toward her? It's, listen, words can be cheap. You can't be apathetic. You've got to be willing to put the 1 Corinthians 13 work into it and not be rude and show her kindness and do all the things that 1 Corinthians 13 says to do. You've got to put the work into it. Don't be apathetic. Don't be uh, accusational. Don't be accusing and blaming others. And, uh, and stop assuming things. Stop assuming things. As we move through this sermon series, we're not going to assume anything. We're just going to go and see what God's Word says, plain and clear. And we're going to walk through this week by week and say, God, show me how I can work to become a better spouse and how we can have a better marriage. Are you willing to walk through that journey? Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your Word. I thank you that you have not left us without the tools necessary to build a great marriage. We don't just have to hope we bump into happiness. We don't just have to hope that we somehow accidentally find marital bliss. You put the instructions, you put the directions in your word. And so we're coming to you now, God, and we're asking for you to take your word and show us. Help us not to just assume things and read into things. Help us to get a clear and correct picture of our, our spouse and what they're saying. Help us not to be apathetic, but to be willing to put in the work and the communication and the prayer and the Bible study, and all that's necessary, the good deeds, the works needed to build a great marriage. I thank you, Father. I thank you, God. And we give you honor and praise. We won't, we won't, we won't, we won't cast blame. We're just going to say, God, make me the best husband or wife, the best spouse that I can be. Make me the best Christian on the job that I can be. Not just, not just a good person at home, but. I want to be a great representative of you to all my coworkers, to all of our friends and neighbors. And I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name.